of a God that loves us so much. We're so blessed to have a, a pastor and, and his sweet wife who loves us so much. And we're all blessed to have the Holy Spirit within each of us. Um, you know, the worship music today, first service and this service, really touched me. You know, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. You know, fill the atmosphere. Um, I, I, thankfully, I won't be singing for you, okay? <laughs> That's good for your ears. But, but the Holy Spirit is incredibly, incredibly welcome because each of you who are a Christian, that Holy Spirit is inside of you. Now, when, when, when you first become a Christian, yes, thank God's salvation. It's huge. It's wonderful. It's this incredible gift of God that, that you'll have eternal life. But you're still an infant. You have, there's the Word of God to learn. We have to grow and mature. And as we grow and mature, so does that Holy Spirit. Because when we find the Lord and we're saved, our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. He dwells inside of us. However, once we mature and we seek him, and, and the message will, will help explain this, we learn that we, there's another thing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where we welcome the Holy Spirit who's already there, but we surrender to him, Lord, because the Holy Spirit is God dwelling inside us. We, we surrender to you, Lord. Let your will be done. Fill me with living waters to overflow from me, to come out on the earth, to do your will, Lord. That's what it's about. Um, so I'd like to start with an opening prayer, if I may. Lord God, you are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the beginning and the end. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Father, we humble ourselves before you. We thank you for all that you have done for us, Lord, that we don't deserve. Jesus, we ask that you open our spiritual eyes and ears to enable us to understand your word. We ask that you open our minds to the wisdom of your word and your ways. Let us understand your message today, Lord. Write it upon our hearts and help us apply it in our lives and in the lives of those who come in our path. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hallelujah. Oh, I forgot. I'm the big shot today. I got the remote. It works the same way at my house. If you got the remote, you're in charge. <laughs> um, you know, I love this picture of Jesus and, and the Holy Spirit descending like a dove and, and the living waters. And, you know, Pentecostals, uh, hang on just a minute. Pentecostals believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are special abilities given to Christians to enrich and strengthen their church and individual spirit lives. We believe these gifts are meant to be experienced today, not just back in the Bible when we open up and we read these fantastic true stories, but today as in right now. We believe that Jesus still heals people and that the Holy Spirit still speaks to people through the gift of prophecy. We believe that speaking in tongues is a genuine gift for today. And it is important in the life of Christian believers. It is this belief that has been our distinctive witness to the global body of Christ today. Church, we believe in miracles. I mean, it's not, uh, you know, uh, tooth fairy under the pillow with the tooth and all. No, we believe in miracles. We believe in the laying on of hands. We believe praying for healing. We believe, you know, my, my, I know my God, he's the one who raises the dead. My God, he's the one who takes clay and breathes into his nostrils and creates a human, creates life. That's who our God is. Uh, you know, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are working today in the, in the lives, the personal lives of four square pastors, and their churches, and keep in mind, the church isn't this building. The church is the body of Christ. That's every one of you sitting in those chairs. And where you're sitting, you may think you're sitting alone in that chair, but you're not. The Holy Spirit is within you. Uh, without the gifts of the Spirit, Foursquare ministry would look really different. 
no miracles, no healing, no deliverance, no prophecy. Without the gifts of the Holy Spirit, supernatural ministry would not exist in our churches. But with the gifts of the Spirit, supernatural ministry does exist and becomes extremely, extremely effective. People are transformed through miracles, healings, deliverance, life-changing words of prophecy, and much, much more. You know, if you'd have known me a long time ago, and much younger, but before I was a Christian, you may or may not like me too much. But I tell you, God transformed my life. Each of you knows Pastor Joe. Call him up and talk, tell him about Chris. Hey, what about that Chris? You know, Pastor Joe used to give me two and three hours every Wednesday in his office just to talk to me about the Bible. And, and then funny, at one point, this is actually what he said. He says, you know, Chris, every time I mention a scripture, you finish it before I can finish. So I'm going to teach you how to minister. And so all of a sudden he was teaching me something that I didn't know much about. And, you know, God puts those kind of people in our lives. Um, you know, I've had three mentors in my, my life. I've had Pastor Danny. He used to always elbow me and get me up with this microphone to MC once in a while. I had Pastor Court in the class, and now is my head pastor. And, of course, Pastor Joe. Uh, and I just love them all, and I thank God so much for all of them. But that's how the Holy Spirit works. He knows what you need, and, and he provides it, and, and, but he provides it for God's purpose. Um, you know, church, um, uh, spirit-led ministry uh, leads to change lives. Because God does significant things through the gifts he makes available through the Holy Spirit. But we can't pick and choose which gifts we believe in. Oh, I don't believe in spiritual disturbance, but oh yeah, healing, I believe in that. Or, oh, you know, I don't believe in prophecy today, you know, but I believe in discernment of the spirits. You know, no. If you believe in one, you believe in them all because they all come from the same place. Amen. So, the Holy Spirit distributes these gifts as he wills. We can't limit him to just one expression. Um, and also, church, we believe in the that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is an experience which usually happens separately from salvation. So don't panic if you're not seeing spiritual gifts yet in your life. We're going to talk a little more about that in a moment. But um, it, it is a... Um, we have to have, the greatest need in the church today is to have the Spirit of the Lord upon us. We have to have the anointing. Because we can't do it on our power. It's God's work with God's power. All glory to Him. You know, in the scripture that follows, Jesus is speaking here and quoting uh, the prophetic words of the prophet Isaiah. And it's in Luke uh, chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You know, in this scripture, we really do see something very powerful. First of all, we see that Jesus knew exactly what he was supposed to do. Second, we see that Jesus knew that he was empowered to do the work. You, you know, church, yes, Jesus is God, but he didn't come here with his using his supernatural powers when he walked on the earth. He was in full obedience. He had set those aside. He was in full obedience to God the Father. And through his faith and through his filling of the Holy Spirit, he didn't resist and grieve the Holy Spirit at all. Therefore, these miraculous things that he did occurred over and over and over again. So, um, you know, in other words, Jesus was consciously aware of an equipping, a supernatural endowment. It's called the anointing. It is in the mind of God today that every one of his people would also be consciously aware of this anointing. So that every single one of us could say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. 
Okay, now you know who his people are, right? Raise your hand if you belong to Jesus. Amen. Talking to you. Okay. Praise God. You know, this isn't simply an idea or an expression or a figure of speech. We're talking about the tangible, manifested reality of the power of God resting upon your life. It's there. It's there. There for the having. You know, uh, when the anointing would come on Samson, he knew it. There was a conscious awareness that a supernatural power and anointing was upon him. Samson knew when the power was on him, and he knew when it wasn't. When this power, this anointing, this unction was upon him, Samson was unstoppable. And he moved in a supernatural arena. And you know, church, our battle is, in, is against spirit, it's spiritual warfare. So this is the realm we're talking about. And we fight it with the word of God. We fight it with the Holy Spirit. You know, God is the one that takes care of our battles. He that is within me is greater than he who is within the world. Amen? You know, there was a shadow, a type, of the anointing that was going to come upon Jesus Christ, the anointing that was on Samson. But this shadow was going to come upon Jesus and his covenant family through the Holy Spirit. Now, who's his covenant family? All believers are in the covenant family of God. I already had you raised your hand, so that's you. Okay? We are the covenant family of God. It's my intent this morning to help us all realize that the anointing was not just for Jesus, nor is it just for apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds and teachers, and all of you PSOM students and all you discipleship ministry students know that shepherds and teachers are pastors. You know, this anointing is for every God-called, blood-washed child of God. That includes me, and that includes you. I can hear you breathing out there. Are you there? Oh, amen. Hallelujah. You know, it's the will of God that every blood-washed, Holy Spirit-filled believer could say with the same certainty and the same authority as Jesus did, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me. The anointing is the divine enablement and the spiritual equipping carry on the ministry of Jesus. Acts 10.38 tells us how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Amen? Brothers and sisters, Jesus is the patterned son. He is the firstborn of many and we are adopted into the family of God. Now we can say, we are anointed with the Holy Spirit and power. We go about doing good for all who are under the power of the devil because God is with us. Tell your neighbor, I am anointed. Tell them, God is with me. Amen, I hear you now. Jesus in his physical body is no longer here, but the anointing is still here. The same Holy Spirit and power is still here, and now we are his body. We are his hands and his feet. We are his voice on the earth. We are anointed to carry on his work. We are anointed to preach the gospel, to cast out devils, to heal the sick, to deliver the bound and the oppressed, and to set the captives free. Hallelujah. This anointing is heaven's power. It's Holy Spirit power. You can't see it with your natural eyes, but when it touches you, you will know. The anointing is burden removing, yoke destroying, stronghold demolishing power. The power of God. Isaiah 10.27 says, And it shall come to pass in that day 
that his burden shall be taken away from off your shoulder and his yoke from off your neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. 1 John 2.20 says, but you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. 1 John 2.27 says, but the anointing which you have received of him stays in you. Do you understand that, church? It stays in you. He gives you the knowledge. He gives you the unction, the urge. The Holy Spirit does only God's will. But this is what the power of God is all about. Church, you have an unction. You have an anointing. It's the same anointing Jesus had. You know, not everybody's a pastor, but everybody is a minister. The Great Commission says, go and teach them his commands and to obey. Well, guys, when we first find the Lord, somebody has to teach us what, you know, what does the Bible say? How do we understand? We need to humble ourselves and disciple ourselves to someone that has more experience so that we can do ministry together. The more the elder and the younger one, and both can grow. I disciple myself under Pastor Courtney, and I am happy to humble myself to do it because I learn so much and I grow in the Lord. Amen? So if you don't already have one, find somebody, you know, who could, who could you know, help you grow in the Lord. You know, I was in my discipleship ministry, and I said to Brother Clark over there, Oh, Brother Clark, you know, I got a pretty good Bible study every Friday. Boy, it'd be nice if you come. And I thought, wow, that'd be great. And he says, well, you know, I, I go to the one with Pastor Court. I'm like, oh, okay. That's all right. You're in a good place. <laughs> hey, God, God, God uh, makes it available for everybody. Praise God. Uh, you know, church, we got the power. And do, we don't really recognize just how much power we have access to. We don't realize it. You know, the sad truth is, a large majority of the body of Christ have never really connected into the power supply of the Holy Spirit. The majority of the body of Christ are living weak, inferior, and anemic lives. And are always looking for someone to bless them, encourage them, lift them up, and prophesy over them. In other words, many of God's people are living their lives as a professional patient. You know, their lives are always in need, always struggling, always hurting, always suffering. What God wants to do by the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit is to turn every patient into a doctor. Every one into a doctor to bring you to a place where you are functioning by the anointing and ministering that anointing so that you are able to inject others with the power of God that will save them, heal them, and deliver them. You know, how often do we see us? We just did it again this morning, laying on of hands. That is so biblical. That is the most common way to transfer this power. There's other ways, but that's the most common one. Uh, you know, we see an example of this in Acts uh, chapter 3, uh, verses 2 to 8, which tells us. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping Praising God. You know, Peter and John looked at this poor crippled beggar sitting by the temple gate asking for money for any who would pass by or, you know, anybody that had a surplus. 
He was a poor and fortunate soul who just lived on other people's generosity. Every day, somebody picks him up, carries him to a spot outside this beautiful gate of the temple where he would sit and beg. What I love about Peter and John was that they saw a future for this man beyond what he could see for himself. He couldn't see anything different in his future other than to sit and beg every day. When Peter and John saw him, they were moved with the compassion of Jesus. You know, church, compassion and pity are two different things. Pity may look and feel sorry, it may even cry, but compassion acts. Compassion changes the situation. Peter and John saw this poor man, they saw a future for him, and they were moved with compassion. When Peter said, look at us, it was because he knew they had not only the compassion, but the capacity to change this man's situation. I wish every member of our church, every single one, understood just how much power we have available to each of us. You know, read the Bible. Nothing's changed. There's no scripture that says, oh, and this was before and not now. No. I know. I've read it over and over and over and over. It's not there. So, you know, all of us were walking all around with the same spirit, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And it lives inside of us. The supernatural, miracle-working power of God is in us. You're not alone in your chair right now. You're Christian. The Holy Spirit is within you. God is sitting in every chair. You know, and I feel kind of blessed to be preaching to God. Thank you, Lord. You know, but, but you know, one of the devil's greatest fears is that we will recognize who we really are and that what we have and what we can do. Peter and John knew the spiritual life power was in them. They also knew that they had the ability to transfer, to release that power to others. Remember, Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. That's the key. What I do have. In other words, I know what I have. Peter and John were consciously aware that they had in their possession a power greater than themselves. Peter said, but what I do have, I give you. In other words, I present to you, I offer you, I release to you, I transfer to you, I give to you. You got it. This power is going from them outward, okay? And so Peter, taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. Peter was pulling him into his destiny, pulling him out of his past, pulling him up out of all his guilt and shame. Could you imagine being a beggar every day by the gate? And not only are you a beggar, you can't even get there. People have to carry you there every day. What a thing to do day after day, week after week, year after year. How depressing, how despairing. But now they pull him up out of his emptiness and his helplessness, pull him up out of his brokenness, pulling him up, up into wholeness, up into joy, and up into fullness. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. Was it God's will to heal this man and make him whole? We know it was. But why didn't it happen sooner? Because no one had passed his way with the knowledge of possessing the power to change his situation. I'm telling you today that it is the will of God to heal the sick, deliver the bound, the oppressed, and to set the captives free. But I'm also telling you that although it is God's will, and even though Jesus paid the price, and even though the power of God is available, nothing is going to happen until we realize that we are the carriers, the conduits of the power of God. Uh, you know, how many of you have fans at home when it gets hot? You plug in a fan. Does that fan work? Yeah, me too. I got a couple up and downstairs. But you know what? 
What happens if you don't plug the fan in? Nothing. Nothing. Well, church, if you want to move in the power of, of the Holy Spirit, you got to plug into it. So, you know, I'm t I'm just, nothing's going to happen until we start laying our hands on the sick, until we start lifting them up in Jesus' name, and until we start casting out devils. I ain't afraid of the devil. And yeah, I'm a pastor. Oh, I got a big target on my back. But he who is within me is greater than he who is within the world. Also, Jesus' 40 days of temptation, did he use his power to go zap devil, boom, send you to a different universe? No. He used scripture. The same scripture you have in your hand today. The very same. Resist the devil, he will flee. Amen. Hallelujah. So, we got to start, guys. And, you know, there are people just like this crippled beggar all around us today. You know, where I live, I live over by the Grove, but there's a lot of homeless folks over there that are cold and hungry. A lot of them are sick and oppressed and a lot of other stuff. But, you know, even though God wants them well and whole, they will die lost, sick, and afflicted if we don't recognize that we are the channels of God's power. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me, not to make me feel good, not to give me goosebumps, but the anointing is on me to prophesy. I know I've done it. I've done it. I, I've, I've had confirmations of it, okay? The anoint, you know, I discern spirits. Is it good or is it bad? I know it's happened over and over. I also lay hands on the sick. Uh, there's another long story behind that one. We'll cover another day, but I'm telling you, God wants me to pray for people and lay hands upon them. To rebuke sickness and disease, to cast out anything the devil has brought upon you, or to you or upon you. I'm anointed. I am anointed to release you from your heavy burdens, but it isn't me. It's God. Glory to God. It's the Holy Spirit. You know, all believers are anointed. You are anointed. Tell your neighbor, you are anointed. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, I am anointed. Hallelujah. I am anointed to declare to you that your debt has been paid and your sin debt has been canceled. Jesus himself carried your sickness and your disease in his own body. 1 Peter 2.24 is your receipt or recibo, depending on how you want to hear it, for perfect healing. Peter says, he himself bore our sins. It would be better if I did it that way. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Where does, where does sickness and death come from? The Garden of Eden at the fall. People used to live forever. Not anymore. There's a whole bunch of cemeteries that will show you all about it. Okay, they're, they're, they're everywhere. But we have been set free. We have been given eternal life so that we will not perish, because our God resurrected first. Amen? You were healed. You were redeemed. You were delivered. You were set free. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid for everything. Be healed. Be restored. Be made whole. Walk in Jesus' name. See in Jesus' name. Hear in Jesus' name. The anointing is here. To heal you now. The anointing is here to deliver you and set you free. The anointing is here to destroy every yoke. Be free in Jesus' name. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, where the anointing is, there is freedom, brothers and sisters. There is freedom. The Spirit of the Lord is here. I know He's here because His anointing is on me and on you. But I tell you, 
that we need to boldly step out in faith to use the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You need to stand up or in front of a room full of people and you need to let it fly and tell them. You need to, you need to mention to your neighbors at home, if, it's a, if you can, to your co-workers at work. If you sit on a bus next to somebody that needs to hear it, let them know about Jesus. That's what we're here for. You know, we need to be bold, and we're reminded in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, which tells us, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit of God, the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Timothy could not be passive. He needed to be bold. And by the way, that was the Apostle Paul talking to Timothy, who was a pastor. And he told him to be bold and fan into flame the gift of God which was in him. Spiritual gifting is in each one of you. You may, you may not know what they are, but it's there. It's there. And, and in fact, pastors will help you find out what those are. But, but I'm telling you, each of you is gifted. You know, but God may have gifted a person, but just because someone has certain gifts does not mean that they are being used for God's glory and his kingdom. Many gifts need to be fanned into flame. You know, this reminds us that God does not work his gifts through us as if we were robots. You know, even when he gives a person gifts, God leaves an element that needs the cooperation of their will and desire and drive. You know, so we can fulfill the purpose of these gifts. You know, we need to step out in faith, church. Some are waiting passively for God to use them. But God is waiting for them to fan into flame the gifts that are already placed there within them by him. You know, some are waiting for a dramatic new anointing. Oh, Lord, I'm waiting for a new one. But God's waiting for them to fan into flame what he has already given them. You know, fanning into flame has the idea of stirring up a fire. And to keep it burning bright and strong, a fire left to itself will always burn out. Even those giant wildfires, as terrible as they are, if you just left it alone, which, you know, of course you don't want to do that, but if you did, eventually it'll stop. But a fire to keep burning has to be fanned into flame. And God wants us to keep our gifts burning for him. And I'm going to give you the PSOM word of the week here, okay? The ancient Greek word, anadzo porejo, means either to kindle afresh or to keep in full flame. And that's what we have to do with these gifts, brothers and sisters. I'm telling you, Kapatid, that's what we got to do. Now, you know, God used the laying of hands to communicate spiritual gifts to Timothy. This is not the only way God gives gifts, but it's a common way. and means we should never neglect the laying on of hands of other people. There's a very strong spiritual purpose for it. Um, you know, it's a good thing also to have others pray for us. Asking that God would give us spiritual gifts that might be used to bless and build up the body of Christ. We know, we know why Timothy can be bold in using the gifts that God has given him. It's because the spirit God gave us, and listen closely, does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Now, we're going to find out why he gave those to us. You know, we all face situations where we feel timid and afraid. You know, if I handed this microphone to my wife over there, you're going to see some shaking knees. Okay? You know, but for other people, it's not a problem at all. And, and you know, if I, have to, if I have to dress and color and coordinate, I'm going to tremble my knees because I don't know how. But, you know, we all face situations where we feel timid and afraid. For some, speaking in front of others makes them fear. Others are afraid of confrontation. Some fear being made to look foolish. Others are afraid of rejection. And I have some Filipino friends that get real shy if they make a mistake with their English. Anybody know about that? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, you guys have all the languages. I'm an envy of you. But, you know, 
we 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 need to deal with fear because we all have it. But the first step in dealing with fear is to understand that fear is not from God. Amen. Hallelujah. The second step in dealing with such fears is understand what God has given us. A spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. Now, we're going to rightly divide the word here. I know I've said that a few times. I've done that on purpose. But we're going to take power, love, and self-discipline. We're going to find out. Oh, so that's why God gave that to us. Okay, first of all, God has given us a spirit of power. When we do his work, proclaim his word, and represent his kingdom, we have all his power supporting us. We are safe in his hands. Amen. And God has given us a spirit of love. Now you're thinking, well, I got power, all right. Why do I have love? Because this tells us a lot about the power he has given us. Many think in power of terms of, you know, what I can force others to do. But Jesus' power is expressed in how much we can love and serve others. Okay, that's where the love comes in. If you have power, you need God's love to, to wield it. And God has given us self-discipline. And I'm going to, the ancient Greek word here, it has an idea of a, a calm, self-controlled mind in contrast to the panic and confusion that rushes in when we're in a fearful situation, like, like one of Pastor Corny's final finals in PSOM. You know, I, oh, my God, you know. <laughs> How many years of church history? How many thousands of years? Oh, my God. No. <laughs> but, you know, church, Paul wrote this to Timothy because boldness matters. Without boldness, we can't fulfill God's purpose for our lives. God's purpose for us is more than making money, more than being entertained, and more than being comfortable. God's purpose for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the spiritual gifts allows each of us to move in a supernatural arena. We can't do that on our own. We need our God for that. You know, we are to use the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us to touch God's people and help a needy world. Fear and timidity, which is, means being shy, will keep us from using the gifts that God has given us. God wants each of us to take his power, his love, and his calm thinking to overcome fear so that we can be used by God. Amen? You know, a number of you may be regularly using the spiritual gifts that God has given you. You know, some may be seeing sporadic experiences of these gifts. They flash in and out in your lives. Others may not have had any of these experiences. If not, you may not have experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit yet, which is often and mostly a secondary experience to salvation. You know, beloved, that's my Pastor Joe. Beloved, I, I could do this too. Ah, is this Pastor Joe or what? <laughs> um, I don't know I don't him. Um, I, I tell you, uh, I can assure you that God does not have favorites. He loves each of us equally, whether we're the most infant Christian or the most mature, or if we're not even Christian at all, he still loves us enough to send his son to die on the cross for us. He loves us each equally. However, God has intimates who get closer to him, like the apostles Peter, James, and John. Today, these intimates seek him, and they find him in his word, in the Bible. They study it diligently. They're in discipleship classes. They're in PSOM. They're in prayer. They're in, 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 through the Holy Spirit, they find God. They, but they also humble themselves to be discipled. You know, it's not easy for a grown person to come to another adult and say, I want you to disciple me. You know, it makes you, uh, it makes you feel like maybe there's something uh, missing. Or, or, but, but, but that's what we need to do because when we find our salvation, we're like the little baby laying there that can't even crawl. You know, goo goo ga ga. 
right? Make noise. Eh, can't even bring the bottle. Don't know how to feed themselves. That's what we are. And yet, all too often, we stay that baby. We stay that infant. Yeah, we come to church, and we see our friends, and we pray, and we praise, and then we go home. And maybe not Monday through Saturday, maybe we're not as Christ-like as we are on Sunday. But I'm telling you, the deeper you dig into the Word of God, He tells us to seek Him. If you seek Him, He says you'll find Him. And I got to tell you, that seeking never stops. If anybody here has the impression that uh, a pa even the lead pastor, he's done studying the Word of God, you're wrong. Uh, the study stays, if anything, it's harder. He has to dig even deeper. Uh, and, and so our whole lives, we do that. And if we do that, we become intimate with the Lord. And, yeah, and, and you know, uh, uh, then we learn how to truly love one another. We learn how to forgive one another. We're humble. We're discipled by others. We grow up. We start discipling other people. Together we do ministry. Together we grow in the Lord. We become other-centered, not self-centered. You know, these kind of Christians are spiritually mature and growing still. See, now we're approaching the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're talking about God moving in miraculous ways. And these kind of Christians are teachable. And they're hungry for God. Church, the closer we get to God, the more intimate we become. And the more we move in the power of the Holy Spirit, you end up hearing his voice better. You know what he wants you to do, and you do it. And he makes it work because of his spirit. So the closer you get to God, the more blessings and actions of God will be in your life. And God wants you to experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you desire to experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to ask you to repeat a prayer after me. But I'm also going to ask you, because we're crying out to Almighty God, to lift your hands as we repeat this prayer. Please raise your hands if you want to get be baptized in the Holy Spirit. God is, God is calling you. Listen to what's in your heart. Repeat after me, please. Heavenly Father, at this moment, I come to you. I thank you that Jesus has already saved me. I pray that the Holy Spirit might come upon me and immerse me. Lord Jesus, baptize me now in the Holy Spirit I receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit right now by faith in your word. May the anointing, the glory, and the power of God come upon me and into my life right now. May I be empowered for service from this day forward. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for baptizing me in your Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. As I close this sermon, I want to pray the words of Paul of Colossians chapter 3, 16 and 17 over you. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen and amen. God bless you all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.